dear fellas, welcome back, it's T Square the Explorer. I would like to preface this video by saying that it's not a read aloud video, so you're free to pause when and where you need to go through the contents displayed on the screen. And I apologize for the unavoidable external noises. Also let me make it clear that I made this video by gathering all the needed information available from the internet, so of course all rights are reserved to their rightful owners. Alright, enough is enough. Let's jump straight into it. So today let's discuss about Le Corbusier, an architect, and his works. Charles Edward Jondret was his actual name. He was a Swiss-born French architect, designer, urban planner, artist, painter, writer, whatever he can do, he did a lot. Hats off. His career spanned across five decades and he designed buildings in many places like in Europe, Japan, India, North and South America. He was one of the most important figures for the introduction of modern architecture. The ones which we see now. Like he promoted many characteristics like clean geometric forms, flexible planning, everything like that. He was dedicated to providing better living conditions for people who were living in crowded cities. He was also an influential figure in urban planning. Fun fact, Le Corbusier owned a dog named Pinsio, meaning paintbrush. Cool, huh? Also, he started creating his own style called Purism. So, another fact, on 17 July 2016, 17 projects by Le Corbusier in 7 countries were inscribed in the list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So, is it a coincidence? Like 17, 17, 7. Okay, well, I find it funny. Also, Charles Edward Jernred. He chose his name, Le Corbusier, as a pseudonym when he started writing. Did I say that before? Also, next up is Le Corbusier's five points of architecture. These five points were his ideas of how his buildings or his designs should be like, what all features he should incorporate in his designs. He mentioned these five points in his book Words on an Architecture or Towards an Architecture which we'll be discussing about later. So right now, these five points are Pilotus It is a replacement of supporting walls or the load bearing walls with a grid of reinforced concrete columns. Now, these concrete columns bear the structural load coming from upstairs and it is the basis of the new aesthetic. Second one the free designing of the ground floor plan. That is when the supporting walls are absent, it gets a flexible plan. Third point, the free design of the facade. That is the facade is now free from structural constraints and it becomes lesser in weight or rather lighter so it can be more open or it can be made entirely of glass which allows lots of light to enter and also there is no need for lintels or other structure around the windows since the building is supported by the columns and next point is 
the horizontal window. That is the ribbon window. Since the wall doesn't support the house, the windows can run the entire length of the house. So all rooms can get equal lighting. Next point is, or the fifth point is, the roof terrace or the roof gardens. Okay, the gardens on the roof. So, the sloping roof is replaced by a flat roof and now this roof can be used as a garden for promenades, sports or a swimming pool. In fact, he was trying to replace the ground which is used to build the building. He was trying to bring that ground onto the roof so that he wouldn't lose any part of the greenery. Now, the perfect example for these five points of architecture by Le Corbusier is Villa Savoy. It's a modernist villa in Poesy in the outskirts of Paris, that is France. And it was designed by Le Corbusier along with his cousin Pierre Jeanne. They built the house using reinforced concrete. Villa Savoy is one of the best examples of Le Corbusier's five points. Also the carpet center. Also the carpenter center for the visual arts at Harvard University. One of his only building in the United States is an example for his five points of architecture. Now, when we talk about Villa Savoy, this house was originally built as a country retreat for the Savoy family. After being purchased by the neighboring school, it became the property of the French state in 1958. It had to go through a lot of proposals to demolish it, but still survived and later it was designated as an official French historical monument in 1965, which is actually something that is not common as Le Corbusier was still living at that time. So yeah, quite cool, huh? Villa Savoy was also registered as the UNESCO World Heritage Site. Now let's talk about how he incorporated all of his five points in Villa Savoy. Firstly, he lifted the entire structure off the ground by supporting it with pilotus or the concrete stills or concrete columns. Now, these pilotus gave the structural support for the house so he didn't have to use the lord bearing walls and this provided a free facade that is lighter facade and an open floor plan which gave the flexibility or the choice of how to use the floor space next is the strips of ribbon windows that was given on the second floor. It gave a lot of light inside and also consider it as a greenhouse which is completely made of glass and allows to lock the sunshine or the heat inside. So this was really good for the Western European climate. The fifth point is the roof garden. And there was a ramp rising from the ground level to the third floor, roof terrace, which acted as a promenade throughout the structure. Le Corbusier also admired the ocean liner. So we can see the white tubular railing. And also the driveway around the ground floor with its semicircular path measures the exact turning radius of a 1927 Citroen automobile. 
just like the automobiles we have now, like the Toyota, so the Hyundai. Since we discussed about the five points of architecture proposed by Le Corbusier, let's talk about the book in which he actually mentioned his idea. was une architecture toward an architecture now this book written by le corbusier was recently translated into english as toward an architecture but it is commonly known as towards a new architecture after the 1927 translation by frederick eschels it is a collection of essays written by le corbusier and exploring the concept of modern architecture. This book has had a lasting effect on the architectural profession and also it became a subject of hatred for many of them but it is an unquestionably important work of architectural theory. The architectural historian Rainer Barham wrote that its influence was beyond that of any other architectural work published in the 20th century and that unparalleled influence has continued unabated into the 21st century. This book contains seven essays, all but one of which were published in the magazine Elspret Novio beginning in 1921. Each essay dismisses the contemporary trends of art deco or that intern intricate designs replacing them with architecture that was meant to be more than a stylistic experiment rather an architecture that would fundamentally change how humans interacted with buildings now this new mode of living was derived from a new spirit defining the industrial age demanding a rebirth of architecture based on function and a new aesthetic based on pure form which gave rise to purism. There were certain controversies behind this book. The authorship of the book was complex. Le Corbusier called Elspirit Novio with fellow purist painter Emily Ozenfand. They co-signed many of the original essays as Le Corbusier Sognier and Ozenfand had been a close friend of Corbusier. Ozenfand denied having written the book claiming that the essays were based on conversations the two had together about theories written by August Perret and Adolf Loos. But as the book became popular, the fight became more heated. Ossenfan began to claim not only more credit for authorship, but also that Le Corbusier had purposefully excluded him by dedicating the original edition to him. The English translation of the book has also been a source of controversy with regards to its change of style and very specific alterations to the text. The alterations have generated criticism and required correction even as some of them began to define architectural language. A new translation was released in 2007 that is meant to be truer to Le Corbusier's intention. Finally. Le 
Kabozia was also an amazing artist. More towards the category of abstract. I love abstracts. So, yeah, he's kind of cool. Well, in 1918, Le Corbusier met the Cubist painter Amelie Ozenfan. Ozenfan encouraged him to paint and the two began a period of collaboration. Rejecting Cubism as irrational and romantic, the pair jointly published their manifesto, a press Le Cubisme, and established a new artistic movement called Purism. Yeah. So Ozenfan and Le Corbusier began writing for a new journal, L'Esprit Novio, and promoted with energy and imagination his ideas of architecture. Now, let's talk about his furniture designing. He was interested in that too and obviously made a great contribution. So, Le Corbusier was against the finely crafted, handmade furniture made with rare and exotic woods with inlays and coverings and all those intricate designs. So, following his usual method, as we have noticed till now, he first wrote a book with all his theories of furniture, complete with memorable slogans and all those stuff. Then he actually called for furniture that used inexpensive materials and could be mass produced. So he described three different types of furniture, namely type needs, type furniture, and human limb objects. He also said that furnitures like chairs are architecture, sofas are borgias. Lake Abuzir actually used ready-made furniture from Thornet to furnish his projects. Later, following his publication of his theories, he began experimenting with the furniture design. He invited architect Charlotte Perrien to join his studio as a furniture designer. His cousin Pierre Generet also collaborated in many of the designs. Now, for the manufacture of his furniture, he turned to the German firm Gebruder Thonet, which had already begun making chairs with tubular steel a material originally used for bicycles in the early 1920s. Lake Abosia was inspired by the designs of Marcel Brewer and the Bauhaus and also Myers van der Rohe, who had begun making sleek modern tubular club chairs and you know, even van der Rohe, he started making his own version in a sculptural curved form with a cane seat. So, after collaboration between Lake Abosia and Perriand, there were three types of chairs made with chrome plated tube frames. He also used cowhide upholstery. These chairs were designed specifically for two, his, two of his projects. Now all the three designs clearly showed the influence of Myers van der Rohe and Marcel Burner. The line of furniture was expanded with additional designs for Le Corbusier's 1929 Salon d'Automne installation, equipment for the home. Despite the intention of Le Corbusier that his furniture should be inexpensive and mass-produced, his pieces were originally costly to make and were not mass-produced until many years later, when he was finally famous. Next up is the open hand. 
It is a recurring motif in Lego Bossi's architecture, a sign for him of peace and reconciliation. It is open to give and open to receive. The largest of the many open hand sculptures that Lego Bossier created is a 26 meter high version in Chandigarh, India, known as Open Hand Monument. Now that we mentioned Chandigarh, let's talk about it. Chandigarh was Le Corbusier's largest and most ambitious project, urban designing. So the capital city of the Haryana and Punjab states in India, it was created after India received independence in 1947. Le Corbusier was contacted in 1950 by Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and invited to propose a project. An American architect, Albert Mayer, had made a plan in 1947 for a city of 150,000 inhabitants. But the Indian government wanted a grander and more monumental city. So, Le Corbusier worked on the plan with two British specialists in urban design and tropical climate architecture, Maxwell Fry and Jane Drew, and with his cousin Pierre Jonred, who moved to India and supervised the construction until his death. Le Corbusier, as always, was a rhapsody about his project. It will be a great city of trees, he wrote, of flowers and water, of houses as simple as those at the time of Homer, and of a few splendid edifices of the highest level of modernism, where the rules of mathematics will reign. His plan called for residential, commercial and industrial areas along with parks and transportation infrastructure. In the middle of the city was the capital, a complex of four major government buildings, the Palace of the National Assembly, the High Court of Justice, the Palace of Secretariat of Ministers, and the palace of the governor. For financial and political reasons, the palace of the governor was dropped well into the construction of the city, throwing the final project somewhat off balance. From the beginning, Le Corbusier was completely dedicated for his work here. He even dismissed the earlier American plan as form ordered and overly filled with parking spaces and roads. His only intent was to present what he had learned in 40 years of urban study and also to the sh uh, to show the French government the opportunities that they missed in not choosing him to rebuild French cities after the war. The other fact is that Le Corbusier designed the city analogous to human body. Like the capital complex in the center was the head, the city center was the heart, the leisure valley, innumerable open spaces and sector greens, which is actually the breathable spaces for the community living there as the lungs, the cultural and educational institutions as the intellect, the network of roads and streets as the circulatory system, the industrial area, the visera. It's actually a good concept. I like it. In his design, he used many of his favorite ideas, like an architectural promenade incorporating the local landscape and the sunlight and shadows into the design. The use of the modular, which we will be talking about in a bit, to give a correct human scale to each element, and his favorite symbol, the open hand. Le Corbusier's design called for the use of raw concrete, whose surface not smoothed or polished and which showed the marks of the forms in which it dried. In 1951, the High Court of Justice was started being constructed. At one point, 1,000 workers were employed on the site. It was later finished in 1956. The building was radical in its design. A parallelogram topped with an inverted parasol. Along the walls were high concrete grills of 1.5 meter thickness 
that served as sun shades. The entry featured a monumental ramp and columns that allowed the air to circulate. The pillars were originally white limestone, but in the 1960s they were repainted in bright colors which better resisted the weather. Next is the Secretariat, the largest building that housed the government offices. It is an enormous block, 250 meters long and 8 levels high, served by a ramp which extends from the ground to the top level. The ramp was designed to be partly sculptural and partly part practical. Since there were no modern building cranes at the time of construction, the ramp was the only way to get materials to the top of the construction site. There were concrete grill, sunscreens over the windows, and a roof terrace, which was actually borrowed from his other designs. Next is the most important building of the capital complex, the Palace of Assembly. It faced the High Court at the other end of a 500 meter esplanade with a large reflecting pool in the front. This building features a central courtyard over which is the main meeting hall for the Assembly. On the roof of the rear of the building is a large tower similar to the form to the smoke stack of a ship. Lake Abuzi added color and texture with an immense tapestry in the meeting hall and large gateway decorated with enamel. Modular Not to be confused with modular, the modular kitchens which is common now. So, the modular is an anthropometric scale of proportions devised by Lake Abuzio. It was developed as a visual bridge between two incompatible scales, the imperial, like the feet and inches, and the metric system, which has the centimeters, millimeters, meters, kilometers, etc. etc. It is based on the height of a man with his arm raised. It was used as a system to set out a number of his buildings and was later codified into two books, Le Modular in 1948 and Modular to 1955. Lake Abusio used the golden ratio in his modular system, which was actually devised by Da Vinci, for the scale of architectural proportion. He even sectioned his model human body's height at the navel with the two sections in golden ratio then subdivided those sections in golden ratio at the knees and throat. He used these golden ratio proportions in the modular system. St. Pierre. It's one of the last major work of Lake Abusia. It's a concrete building in the commune of Fermini, France. It was completed in 2006, 41 years after his death. Firstly, designed to be a church in the model city of Fermini Ward, the construction of which began six years after his death. Due to local political conflicts, it remained stalled from 1975 to 2003 when the local government declared the modern concrete ruin an architectural heritage and financed its completion. The building was completed by the French architect Jos Aubrey, Lake Abusio's student for many years. It has been used for many different purposes as a secondary school and as a shelter as the secularist French state may not use public funds for religious buildings, St. Pierre is now used as a cultural venue. In the World Architecture Survey of 2010 by Vanity Fair magazine, the building was ranked 
as second in the rankings of the top structures built in the 21st century, receiving four votes. American architect Peter Eisenman asserted in his response that this building is the most important structure built since 1980. you can see in the image below, the openings through which the lights enter creates a beautiful constellation design. Well, that's it fellas. So let's end this video with great chords written by Le Corbusier. After all, he was a man with great literary skills. A house is a machine for living in. I prefer drawing to talking, drawing faster and leaves less room for life. To create architecture is to put in order. Put what in order? Function and objects. A hundred times have I thought New York is a catastrophe. And fifty times it is a beautiful catastrophe. Space and light and order. Those are the things that men need just as much as they need bread or a place to sleep. The home should be the treasure chest of living. Architecture is the learned game, correct and magnificent, of forms assembled in the light. The history of architecture is the history of the struggle for light. Well, with that, let's end today's video here. I hope it was useful and informative for each and every one of you who viewed this. So, Happy learning!